Okay, welcome everybody. It is season two opener of DX Leaders. I know we are all excited, especially the Swiss panelists and uh, guests today. Um, after, after such a match last night, uh, it's hard to top that excitement, but we're trying our very best, okay? Um, so uh, welcome to DX Leaders. My name is uh, Lars Fürdisch, former journalist, professional storyteller, and uh, I'm your host today, together with, as last season, Andreas Enderlin. Andreas, did, did you close, a, close an eye last night or after the penalty shootout? Not possible. Not really, Lars, not really, but I'm very excited to be today and, uh, you know, to see you again. Uh, we seem to see each other only virtually, so, uh, you know, uh, but very excited to, to be here and welcome to all the panelists and also on behalf of the Swiss champ. Okay, thank you. And DX Leaders is a, a series uh, of thought leadership. We're kicking that off today with a webinar, as well as an award series. Um, Andreas, where are your 45 minutes of quick intro on the awards? Well, uh, I, will keep it, I will keep it very short this time. Okay, good. I, I can assure you. <laughs> okay, quick intro on uh, those that are tuning in for the first time. Um, as you know, with the onslaught of COVID-19, organizations across all sizes and industries were, for, were forced into uh, ro rolling out digital initiatives and some projects that would have taken years before suddenly were able to be completed in weeks or months. So um, we are looking into different aspects on how that's going. Today's topic is extremely interesting. It's about diversity, inclusion, and digital transformation. How do these things come together? Is it just hype or old wine? Uh, is it here to stay? And um, uh, and Andreas, the uh, uh, founder and partner of uh, Hugo Capital Partners and the co-host, what, what's your take? What's your take on the topic before we introduce our guests? Well, very interesting topic. Very, um, you know, uh, also controversial topic, I guess. And I hope we will have a good discussion. So I'm really looking forward uh, with the panel. I'm, I'm very sure we will have a good discussion. And before we introduce the panel, the panel, of course, a big thank you for all the supporters, of course, Swiss Jam, but especially the main sponsor, Deloitte. On the panel today, uh, we have three real great experts uh, on the topic, and we hope we have a lot of insights and disagreements for uh, sake of a great discussion. Uh, Lauren Bradbury, Executive Director Consulting at Deloitte Asia Pacific. Lauren, how are you doing today? I'm very, very well. Very well, Lars. Lovely, uh, lovely to be here. Excellent. Um, we have Lisa Schroeder, uh, APEC Operations at Vester and SFA Singapore uh, Finance Association, the FinTech leader under 30. Uh, Lisa, we don't need to guess your age, I guess, but how are you doing today? Doing very well. Thank you so much. Excellent. And uh, last but not least, Sergio Salvador, Purpose Coach and Talent Advisor, APEC Digital Practice Leader at Ego, Egon Zender, um, and also a repeat guest on the show. Welcome back, Sergio. Thank you very much, Lars, and I'm very happy to be in this one, the gender diverse member of the panel. That doesn't happen very often. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about diversity, I'm looking about all the Asian faces right now, but we can address that later. <laughs> um, so um, we would like to pose our topic today to, uh, to our guests as well. Do you think that diversity, inclusion, and digital transformation is, as I said, all hype? Is it old wine? Is it here to stay? Um, is it just a trend? Um, please leave your, your, your comments in the chat function, but if you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A function. Yeah, we have the Q&A function here um, um, later, but first let's have a look at our poll. Uh, everybody, all attendees are invited to look into diversity, inclusion and digital transformation. Just a hype, old wine, here to stay. So um, yeah, Lisa, what, what, what's, your, what, what's your take? What, what will be the winner? Um, I guess it's here to stay because we all believe that uh, we will hopefully not be, you know, leaving off this topic and we actually will tackle it more and more every day. Mm, um, okay. Um, uh, Lauren, what's, what's your take? How much, how, how old is this wine? Or it's just a very <laughs> fresh uh, of the field? 
It's a solid vintage. It's a solid vintage and it's all three. It is, it's all three. It, it is old wine. We've been speaking about this for a long time. It needs hype to continue to have it at top of mind. Um, and as Lisa said, it's here to stay and as well it should be. Okay, fantastic. So let's close the poll, have a look. So um, can we see the results? What does the audience think? It's here to stay. Thank you. You tuned in for the right webinar. You are allowed to stay. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, good. But yes, I, I, I love what you said, Lauren. It's a bit of a hype, of course, but topics are seasonal. doesn't make them more or less important, right? Good. Um, so a lot to discuss about that. Um, but first, uh, before we kick off the discussion, the special intro on the awards with Andreas. Uh, the part of the webinar everybody has been waiting for. Now, in all seriousness, it's, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity for companies to get awarded and rewarded for the hard work they've done um, in, in this field. Andreas, can you tell us about this year's DX Awards? Yes, absolutely, Lars. And I promise I will keep it really short because uh, maybe some of our viewers have already heard about the award. Um, and uh, so if we go one slide further, um, we, started, we started this award last year, you know, you can well remember during the lockdown. And it basically had two or three goals. First one, it was really connecting the ecosystem, bringing together the right people in digital transformation. Secondly, um, you know, creating a platform to, for companies to showcase what they're actually doing. And thirdly, it was really also to make sure that, um, you know, companies can actually showcase their digital brand and that, that they can show what they have done and that we have an objective jury and an objective framework to assess the impact of digital transformation. So this year we're coming back um, on the second year, which uh, we're really proud of. Uh, we have lined up um, incredible sponsors and we are really, really thankful and honored to have all these amazing sponsors here, like Acronis, Entia, Inventa, RIB, Six Group, Tilke, and also all our supporters. So we were always saying, um, Lars and um, you know, all panelists, uh, that this should be a award that is really anchored in the ecosystem. It should not be a Swiss award, but really an award for everybody. And so I think we have achieved that with uh, bringing on board, again, you know, all the chambers, um, and a diverse set of different um, uh, supporters and sponsors. So as you can see here, um, subcategories are very diverse. We even have more now. We have a very interesting uh, topic around cybersecurity. I think a topic that is of interest for everybody and also building an infrastructure. I, I believe, in, especially in, in ASEAN, a very, very big topic. And then, you know, our usual subcategories. I think the main difference uh, this year is really that we want to reach out to ASEAN. Um, last year, we were a bit focused on Singapore, but this year it's really about reaching out to, to ASEAN because in the end, we all work in a regional context. We all work with different countries and not only Singapore. So that's um, basically about this year's award. So if we go one further, Clarissa, please. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but there is a clear set of, of steps how we will go through. Um, you know, we are all um, uh, Swiss here in, in essence, so it's very structured and we have a clear view and plan how we want to go through that sessions. So you will see that we are now in the online application phase. So if you have any uh, application, please, it's now time to reach out. We will then go into the private uh, pitching session because we have to narrow down all the applicants. And then, you know, the fun part starts. It's really about the public pitching. And it's really where, um, you know, the jury comes together with the applicants and where we have these incredible sessions. We don't know yet whether it's going to be hybrid or not. Um, that remains to be seen, but we are, uh, either way, we are very much looking forward to, to having these uh, pitching nights. Uh, one further, Clarissa, please. Okay, and then obviously you're all going to ask, okay, what is the assessment criteria? So we work together with um, Deloitte to develop a digital maturity framework 
which touches on five distinctive factors, as you can see here, uh, from strategy, customer, organizational culture. And today we're actually going to cover uh, more a bit of the soft part, um, which is about organization, culture, inclusion, diversity, and leadership, right? And uh, we have found out that this is actually a precondition that is very, very important to drive digital transformation. So if you hand in a application, it will be assessed objectively, that's for sure, and it will be reviewed by um, a very distinguished jury board. One further. Okay, and we've been working very closely with Deloitte and just to give you a sense of um, what we have been doing. So this is a digital transformation um, survey that uh, was done in Thailand. And if we go one further, uh, Clarissa, uh, I just wanna give you a short snapshot um, of what the results were. So clearly the impact of, of COVID has accelerated digital transformation. That's very, very clear. So you can see that a lot of um, companies which were a bit more passive uh, at the beginning have been really accelerating their um, efforts. And it also tells you about, you know, that we first need to work on the basic tech, as you can see here on the right hand side. Um, so it's not always, you know, the big fancy, big shining initiatives, but it's really working on the basics in order to lay the foundation for further efforts. So one further. All right, to wrap this up, um, you know, why should you join the award? It's really about uh, recognition. It's uh, about best practice exchange. As we see today, we will have an amazing panelist um, uh, collection and we, it's all about accessing networks, right? It's uh, about accessing new customers. It's um, making sure that we expand our reach into the region. And then obviously we'll also have prices um, and, you know, that should be motivation enough for the companies to really take part in this initiative. Um, quite interesting prices um, overall. And then, obviously, you will also get a digital certificate uh, to give you assurance that this is the real um, DX award from uh, the Swiss Cham. And that basically rounds off what I wanted to say. And uh, please, uh, if you have a great project in your company, join and get in touch with our wonderful team here, Clarissa uh, and Lisa. And last but not least, I would like to uh, reach out you know, to the team and say a, a big, big thank you for everybody who has been working um, behind the scenes on this award and we're not gonna i'm not gonna mention all the names but you will if you join next time you will get to know them uh, in person with this back to you lars thank you andreas uh fantastic and i see you know one of the supporters is uh, even after last night still the french chamber thank you very much for staying on and uh, supporting <laughs> that Sorry, i could, couldn't resist couldn't, couldn't resist and um, what's the one deadline to remember for the award so by when do they have the applications be in so that's the important deadline right now? Yeah, so end of August is the, is the deadline. Um, so we still have some time. If there are questions, please reach out to the team and they are happy to help. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And I saw already some, some questions coming in. So a reminder at all the attendees, please put your questions in the uh, Q&A function so that the panelists can address what's really on your mind. Uh, so let's kick it off with uh, Lauren, who will give us an introduction on today's topic, because we have that intersection, right? Diversity and inclusion, leadership and digital transformation. All of them, big topics on their own. How do they work together, Lauren? Um, very intricately and quite in quite a complex way. Um, so firstly, thank you for inviting me to have a conversation and to be on the panel today and also to provide the keynote on behalf of Deloitte. Um, I will share just a few slides um, just to set some context and a couple of things that we might not necessarily always think about when we think about diversity, inclusion, empowerment and belonging, particularly through digital transformation. Um, quick intro from me, I'm a partner at Deloitte, Singapore, Southeast Asia. I head our workforce transformation practice for financial services, um, but as a working mum with a five-year-old on school holidays off in the corner, 
Um, I'm very passionate and always have been around building diverse, but mostly inclusive workforces where everyone feels like they belong. Um, and particularly with how quickly things are changing now, it's never been more important. Um, so I'd like to share just a couple of insights um, before we move to the discussion in the panel. So if we can go to the first slide. The next slide, I should say. <laughs> okay, so quite a busy slide, but an important one. Um, because the question is, is this, you know, is it old rhetoric? Is it old wine? Is it here to stay? All of those sorts of things. As I said at the start, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Um, but why this and why now? And why is it so important? Um, I'm not going to share with you details around diversity. I'm not going to share with you the things that you already know. What we do know is that there's a significant rise in business interest, particularly around gender diversity and the individual traits, male versus female, um, that we all know. And I'll share more in the panel when we come to those discussions, but just by way of background, whilst I live in Singapore, I spent many years working with MIT in their neuroscience lab. Um, so living between Singapore and Boston. And what we were looking at there is what are the male and female traits and the brain science behind different leadership in different levels of complexity. Um, so the business case is there, but also the science backs us up that we do need to have more women in more critical roles. Um, the outside in perspective, gender balanced organizations are winning the war for talent. We already know that there is intense scrutiny um, around a number of different platforms that we've seen in the last 12, 18, 24 months. Um, and on the right hand side, down the bottom, it's the right thing to do. So the SDGs that we're all familiar with, you know, one of those is building a gender diverse workforce, gender balance, gender equality. It's something that is incredibly important, something that many businesses are and will be held accountable for. Business case hasn't changed. It has just heightened in a different way. Um, so if you move to the next slide, um, it's heightened in a different way because we're looking at the level of disparity, um, dissonance and argument in executive teams and in leadership teams. And one thing that we were doing at Deloitte is to not just look at, okay, well, what do your numbers look like? As we've said here, this is a specific example for a regional bank, very specific, that was done only a month or two back, um, where the statement was, we've got 52% of women, we must be okay. Uh, but actually, when you look into the data, at first glance, 47% of female, fantastic. When dissected, and this is what I'm just challenging every individual and every leader and every organization to think about is to dig a little deeper. Support roles rarely make it to CEO. We're, we're, we're familiar with this. So when dissected, the representation of women decreased as the level increased. So when we looked at this specific regional bank, very famous one, uh, regional bank, it, it was imbalanced. It was imbalanced. And then we dug in deeper. So gender labor segregation. So whilst women represented a higher number in support services, men still made up the core um, of the, the critical business roles. So what we want to think about is not just numbers, not just quotas, not just something that you can report to the board, but really think it through. So in this example, women make up 52% of the overall workforce, 40% of senior management, so senior vice presidents to MDs, and 30% of group management committee. So we're starting to get smaller and smaller. So as we're dissecting this, it's not about how women make up the workforce. Numbers aren't enough anymore. This is the old hype that quotas, um, quotas are important. And we often have quotas at mid-levels in organisations. And what we're finding is we're challenging organisations to dig into mission critical roles and make those more equal. So it's not about how women make up the workforce. It's whether an equal number can make it to CEO and group management level. That should be our starting point. That should be our goal, not percentages, the equal number that can make it to CEO and group management level. If we move to the next slide. So how do we do it? Um, and there are four, four ways and particularly through digital transformation, which many of our clients are doing, which we're working with day in, day out, but also as a recipient, as we all are sitting here, I look like I'm in my office, I'm in a fake office, I'm in my condo. Um, but as we shift to hybrid work, 
we need to think about um, whilst we're more physically distanced, how do we ensure we remain more socially connected? This is the essence of inclusion. It's the essence of belonging. It's the essence of emotional well-being. So a number of things to think about, and this is the last slide, a number of things to think about, that diversity is a representation. So it's, it's, a, it's a chart that you have. What are the numbers? What does it look like? What are the percentages? But the actions to increase representation, so uncover every process, uncover your bias through data analytics. How many organisations are actually looking at how men and women, different generations, are interacting through network analytics? Um, is it more on phone? Is it on email? What's, what's the judgment call around that? And how do you set up your organization to make sure that physically distanced people remain really tightly connected? Um, and that's really where we're thinking about how people communicate. So I would encourage most organizations to look through your organization network analytics. This gives you insight and data around how people want to be connected because we can't connect the way that we used to. So what happens is we connect how we choose to. And that's your advantage going forward. If you can create platforms where people connect how they choose to, they'll do it more often and more successfully. That then makes people feel more included. So from seats of power where it was top down, where you would have every Friday during lockdown or, or even now, regional managing directors, number of different partners or leaders having conversations where they would speak at you about the week. What are the moments of engagement that you each have as leaders around how you connect with your people? from sharing information, from increasing trainable skills. So looking at your leadership empathy levels. What are you doing to build capabilities and how people actually connect? Because that creates the feeling of belonging. And that's what we want to do in organizations. We work day after day in Deloitte um, internally and with our clients to create three things. Um, so the model that we have developed is around comfort, connection, and contribution. So people feel connected in an organization when they have solid hybrid work disciplines. They know what they need to do, how they need to do it, and who the person is that I need to work with. Otherwise, you create a bottleneck. The communities replicate the feeling of being together, whether it's on campus, whether it's on site, whatever that looks like. Um, and contribution beyond KPIs. So how are you looking at the output versus the input? Um, because one of the key things, again, that we're called in very, very often to talk about is intentionally caring about employees' well-being. So actually, mental well-being is a central focus, um, not just physical and not just digital, not just, okay, that person came to that meeting and so that's okay, they must be fine. Um, but what can you build in intentionally in your day-to-day -day behaviors that helps build the last three that I've spoken about? What intentional actions are you making to make sure that your representation at all levels of the business, particularly mission critical ones, are being represented diversely? What are the micro practices you're building in day to day for moments of engagement with your teams? And what are the micro intentional practices that you're bringing in to make people feel comfortable, connected, and that they can contribute to the bigger part of the organization, even when physically distant? So just a couple of things to think about. The one thing that I want to leave you with is before we move into the panel is don't just look at the data, dig deeper, figure out what that means and how it actually plays out in your organization and what impact it will have one, three and five years down the track. Um, and also recognize that these are iterative processes. Diversity is a representation. Inclusion is an action. Belonging is a feeling um, and well-being is an outcome. So those, those four things I think I'd like to leave you with. Um, Lars, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so let's kick it very quickly with, 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 with just a few um, kind of rapid fire questions. Um, so in, especially last year, we saw that acceleration of digital transformation and more and more organizations talking about uh, diversity and inclusion. Is it just a coincidence? Or why did both of these boosts happen at the same time, Lauren? Why did they both happen at the same time? Yeah. Because nobody knew what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that, that is the thing. These happened at the same time because not only were we plunged into a world where things were highly ambiguous, highly complex, we had to operate in a way that we've not, never operated before. It was outside of our control and outside of our comfort zone. And what happens is that people show up 
in the way that they've learned and the way that they've been trained. Um, and that highlighted a number of gaps in organizations that we have today. A, we don't have a representation adequately in mission critical roles at the top of the business with, and I, I will say this as a woman, but I will say this as, you know, ha having worked at MIT for many years, hopefully with some kind of credibility, these are the traits that are inherently higher in women than men. All respect in the world, but they are. And so then what happens is that there was a dearth of capability to be able to navigate this really quickly. Mm. Um, and so then what happened is we were plunged into a world of ambiguity. Organizations upscaled their digital transformation to the point where they thought it was five years out and now they had to put Zoom across their entire business and they didn't know how to do it. Um, and the capability and the traits of people in the leadership role weren't equipped to handle it as quickly as they could have been. Um, that exposed gaps. And so what we've been doing is trying to figure out what's driving those gaps. Um, and it's those two things coming together. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Sergio, over, over to you. What, you, you agree full heartedly or what's your, your take on why, why did these two mega trends kind of emerge at the same time? Uh, listen, from my perspective, I think that, um, you know, as a, a great person once said, never waste a good crisis. I think ultimately what, uh, what has happened over the last year and a half has been a major crisis that has created essentially almost like a, like a feeling of natural selection in the corporate world that has pushed companies to do things that they would not have done by themselves over many, many, many years. So as tragic as the circumstances have been, because they have been, right, the reality is that in a business environment, it has forced companies and people, most importantly leaders, to start testing and doing things differently. And voila, they actually realized that they could do things differently Right? when something actually stopped the inertia that is inherent to many corporate businesses out there. Right? And we're, seeing, we're starting to see the results of that. Having said that, I think that, that um, applies directly to transformation and digitization. It doesn't necessarily yet, to, to me, apply as much to diversity and inclusion. I think it's something that, um, to Lauren's point earlier and the data that she has uh, very articulately uh, share with us. Uh, we are we have made and we're making great progress in diversity and inclusion. We cannot take it for granted. There's a still a lot more that can be done, and there's a still a lot of areas in diversity that we need to address that haven't been addressed yet. Okay, thank you, um, Lisa. Just to compl complete the complete the round, uh, what what's your take? Um, have you seen in your own organization? And I know. Um, uh, you, you changed roles and you've also been involved in uh, the DX series last year. Um, have you seen any concrete kind of uh, initiatives um, that really brought these two together or were forced to come together? I mean, it's um, as, as uh, Sergio actually pointed out, it's definitely where um, with this whole uh, transformation process of digitalization, different processes, replacing and, or, and rethinking specific processes that automatically comes with, um, yeah, uh, you have to rethink your current model that you're running, which means you have to upskill your current staff, you have to um, invite new members to join the team to bring in new ideas, because eventually that's also bound to happen with digitalization. Um, you obviously have to think outside of the box. You need to take into account what are the technologies you could apply to your own business so that automatically cam comes hand in hand that you have to kind of merge these two trends into one uh, for your organization. And uh, this is exactly what also Lauren mentioned that you have to fill the gaps that you have identified. Hopefully you have identified them correctly so you can fill the, the gaps with um, new people or kind of bring people from different um, business units over to your business unit, whatever that may be. So I think that's definitely a cross change of, uh, of, the, of those two trends. Okay, then maybe let's continue with you. So you, you've come a, come a long way. Uh, you, you moved from the West to Asia. Uh, you uh, were awarded young woman leader under 30 um, in a very tech, what's traditionally male driven uh, in, in environment. So what are some of the strategies you can recommend to leaders across HR and other teams uh, to address these, for example, unconscious biases and, you know, based from your own experience and, and how you deal with these situations to overcome it. 
Yeah, so in, in my situation, it was actually that I was very lucky to have always been surrounded by great leaders myself. So I could definitely draw a lot of um, uh, experience from what how they have been dealing with issues or challenges and how they overcame them together with the whole team that included me back then when I was just an intern, basically, but still they made my voice heard and they really took into account what I could bring to the table. And that's also what enabled me to understand better uh, what I can bring to the table um, when I join discussions, even though I think I'm not as experienced as the other participants of that discussion. Um, and certainly I've also seen those um, yeah, phases where people could not really believe that I'm entering the room and participating in those discussions, even leading certain discussions. But that's definitely been enabled by uh, by my um, peers or by my um, uh, bosses as such. And that's also definitely something that I can always recommend for organizations. Um, yes, it is an unconscious bias. So yes, what can you do about unconscious? Well, there's two ways. Um, so either, so one is um, you can definitely work with networks that already exist that uh, focus on those specific topics of um, unbiased uh, yeah, decision-making processes. So um, I came across a really nice organization here in Singapore called Diversely, which is exactly um, helping um, organizations with digital tools uh, to overcome those biases. Um, other um, enablers could be mentorship programs, um, really kind of help your organization, organization self-help with certain issues. So bringing um, new joiners together with uh, long-lasting on uh, employees because there's different experience that can be cross-pollinated so that's what we've been doing with uh, Swiss Jam for example we also realized there's not a real interaction between our young professionals and more senior um, members of the uh, of the Swiss Jam so that's also something we established well now that everybody's working from home we have one or two hours to spare a month so why not use that opportunity and and spark potential interesting discussions. We don't know what is uh, coming out of it yet, but uh, we will not know if, unless we try. So there's definitely different opportunities we can tap into. So yeah, again, just look into your own organization, what you already have, or get uh, experts in from outside to help you define and find a way. Yeah, thank you. And that's, I, I, I love what you said about, you know, um, uh, it's connecting to what Lauren said at some point in her, in her intro, it's about representation. If you're in the leadership, don't have anybody who can connect, understand, then it's very hard to be represented and, and included, right? So it has to be a two-way street. Um, let's move over to Sergio, maybe from a different perspective, because um, you worked at, you tried to drive Gmail growth when everybody was still hot on Hotmail, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, not sure if everybody if, can remember if, that. If you want to put it that way, but Gmail drove itself. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> it was but, it, it was natural adoption. Um, so um, I think that was just email was one of those key kind of technologies that changed communication through very easy access and very uh, kind of gender uh, connecting. Um, so from a digital transformation point of view, right, um, how do you see that adoption of all kinds of digital technologies um, is changing the way we work? And then from that, from the technology work point of view, is that making inclusion diversity easier or actually harder? For example, you know, is it a generation gap that, yes, digital is fantastic, but it leaves a whole generation behind? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lars, for, um, uh, for putting that forward. And uh, before I answer that question, if you don't mind, I would like to make a couple of additional connections, especially yeah. because there's been a comment on the, on the Q&A already that I would like to address. Um, I think someone was asking about diversity from the perspective of the discussion so far has doubled down a lot on gender. Right? And I think it's important to recognize that that's not what we're referring to. Diversity and inclusion uh, is across the board. Just some data for you. I am an ex googler At the end of the day, I would like to share some numbers. Out of the <laughs> only 24 out of the 5,000 plus board seats in the Fortune 500 index are actually currently filled by openly LGBTQ plus individuals. In 70 countries, this type of individuals being openly LGBTQ plus is still illegal. That includes Singapore, where we're sitting today. Even in the US, where there are protections for these type of individuals and leaders, just uh, uh, you know, just 24 are five, uh, out of the 5,000 seats are openly 
uh, LGBTQ. That's why in at Egon Center, actually about six months ago, we partnered with Out Leadership, which is the first association that is promoting uh, sexual orientation diversity across leaders right, at the CEO level and at the board level in order to drive that, that diversity. In addition to that, a 2013 HBR article, which I think is very popular, but it should be a lot more, affirms that when at least one team member shares a client's ethnicity, the team is more than twice as likely to understand the client's needs that teams where no member, no member shares that, that trait. So I think it's important to recognize the fact that when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we're discussing this across the board. Women is the most obvious one. We're making good, good progress there. We're not making a, such a good progress in, in terms of uh, ethnicity, sexual orientation, etc. I think there are many examples out there to go back to your question of how digital tech adoption is making an impact. Luckily today, right, uh, there is a lot more choice out there. There's a lot more innovation than in 2003 or four when Gmail was first launched. Today, the amount of tools out there, the amount of companies that are innovating and coming up with ideas is significantly larger. No one has a monopoly on innovation. No one has a monopoly, a monopoly on digital transformation, which means that there is always going to be out there right, a, a different tool uh, that um, kind of fills or fulfills the needs of very different groups. The important thing to ensure is that the companies behind those tools, that, that digital transformation, those digital transformation tools are diverse enough across all, all factors in order to, to, to build the right tools that are going to, um, uh, to, to cover the, the widest amount of ground, the, the largest amount of ground in terms of offering so that, um, so that you know, we can continue driving diversity and inclusion from the perspective of the tools that are used. In any case, I'm just gonna wrap up very quickly. Important to keep in mind something that I, I said in my previous, in, in our previous uh, awards in the panel, that is it's important to remember that digital transformation has a little to do with technology, but a lot to do with people. And that's when diversity and inclusion is so, that's why it is so important for transformation. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. I was actually, I was already looking at that question. I thought that alone is a fantastic question to go, 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 go at. Um, so um, thanks, you Sergio. Maybe over to Lauren, right? Um, building on what Sergio just ended, ended with, it's uh, digital transformation, maybe more in the past, was kind of the SAP type. You have to adjust your processes to what a core IT team forces upon you. Now technology uh, is implemented in a very different way that touches way more people. So um, it's more of a general change process. Um, so do you, what's your take on, can you get your company, for example, through DNY initiatives, through culture ready for being, for ready for change? You know, everybody wants to be agile. Everybody wants to prepare for the faster change and, and evolution cycles. Uh, but it's like, just be ready is kind of the message. Um, <laughs> then it doesn't matter what you implement and when, if you generally have that openness for change. So how does that go together from, from your experience? Wow. Um, really, really, really good questions. And so much in there, Lars, so much in there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to carve it out. Um, I think a couple of things. I've never been more busy in Deloitte working on cloud transformation. I'm a human capital partner. I mean, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, we never would have been invited into the conversation around SAP transformation. Now we are the edge that gets organizations in. We've got AWS who we partner with coming to us saying, we actually need your human capital guys to partner with us because a no offense to AWS if anyone's on the call or, or you know is married to someone who is love them all very good friends of mine um, but they are open by saying this is capability uplift and change management and transformation of mindset change management is still older transformation of mindset around we just need to shape up and do things differently I don't need a playbook I don't need to figure out what it is that I need to do I just need to be open if someone's asking me to do something differently that I'll say, okay. Um, and so as, as a human capital partner, working with the digital transformation guys, this is where I'm saying that it is no longer a nice to have. It is no longer the change management adjunct that goes at the end around how do we train some people and give them a handbook. Um, this is getting people on side to begin with, because at the end of the day, there is so much going on in our human world. 
um, in our brains and the family things that we have and the personal things and the professional things that we have, if I can just take a no answer for now and get to it in six months time, I'll do it. So it's getting people to sign up for something that's different. That's a very thing, a very different thing, Lars, to change management and being ready for change. What yeah. we want is people who are actually excited about it yeah. um, and thinking about, as, as you said, Sergio, and I think you may have, you know, looked at maybe a Deloitte deck of mine um, <laughs> or someone's because we use that, never waste, it, it never waste a good crisis. Um, but it is, it's getting people to think differently. So a lot of the thinking that organisations that I'm seeing that are quite progressive is around transformation mindset. A year ago, it was digital mindset. Now it is transformation. Anything's on the table and anything is good. Um, one other thing that I will just add as well, because it builds on what Sergio was saying, is that yes, gender is part of it, but I'm actually on the board of directors for a startup here called Extend My Runway in Singapore. Um, and that is a fantastic organization that works with the University of Dallas, Texas and the head of brain science to look at, um, Sergio, you're clapping, you might, you might know what this is, um, but the ability to decrease cognitive decline in people over 40, and as a 41-year-old, that's terrifying. Um, <laughs> but cognitive decline starts at 40. Um, and so what we're looking at now is from a brain science perspective, how do we have micro habits, micro behaviors from a corporate organization perspective that keeps people continuing to develop because the research shows that if you have a split in your teams of 25 year age difference, this is the research that was done over the last eight years, 25 year age difference, the decision making 12 months out was 75% more effective, faster and more relevant than those with a more smaller, smaller age spread. The question around that for any cynic in the room like I was before I jumped, jumped on board is, does that just mean that the older person gets to make the decision? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The data is the data. The decision-making is the right decision. So it's one of two things. Either it's the group of people from a demographic perspective, from an age point of view that helps decisions, or it's the fact that organisations can help people over 40 slow their cognitive decline to continue to make good decisions. Either way, it's a win-win. Mm. So but I think on. this is something that we're not discussing enough Okay. Um, in terms of diversity and inclusion. Andres. So, Warren, I, I would have one question to you because yeah. uh, so you're saying it's going down to the personal change, right? So it's a personal change, which sounds yes. very easy. And we all know how difficult it is to change personally when it's about us, right? We can talk about the organization, you know, change yeah. and transformation. But when it's about us, when we are the, the 50 year old in the room, not understanding technology, and then suddenly these young people come in, um, and and all, uh, ask all these funny questions. So what are, you know, from your point of view and, and also out to Sergio and also Lisa, you know, what are personal strategy, how we can cope with that change and, and how we can be more open because it's easy to talk about it, right? Yeah. Um, but then really implement it on a personal level is so, so challenging. Um, Andreas, we agreed to disagree and I'm going to do it right now um, because I think... With, again, all, all the love for you, what you've just displayed there is unconscious bias. By showing that you've said that older people struggle more with technology and then we've got younger people coming in. No. Actually, there is great research. And if anyone hasn't read it, I absolutely recommend that you do. It's called Immunity to Change by Dr. Robert Keegan, Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy out of Harvard Graduate School. And what that is about is that we are hardwired to resist change as humans. Um, yeah. at every single age every single age and so what we find is that we have so it's called immunity to change because we all know we have a physical immunity and god knows over the last 18 months we've heard more about that than we necessarily ever thought we would um, but we also have a psychological immunity to change so at every decision point we have one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator and it's there to protect us because we're hardwired to resist ambiguity because ambiguity is a threat that plays out at every age it's inbuilt from age three onwards. So what I would like us to do as leaders and as humans in organizations is to not make that, well, some people can change more easily than others. Some can adapt more easily than others. Actually, everyone struggles with it, but how they show up and how they share it might sound different, 
Um, but I don't think that a 22 year old who's having to navigate organizational politics in an organization is any more equipped to do that than a 55 year old is to pick up some kind of API. I'd like to add to that, and this is going to fully derail us as next questions because we're going off track here. <laughs> <laughs> but so um, there's actually a lot of assumptions that people also make in there, right? So those unconscious biases are present everywhere. Uh, I work with uh, clients all the time at the highest leadership level, and the amount of uh, uh, the questions I get about energy levels, depending on age, on, on age or the potential candidates, is, is quite significant as well, right? Someone in the mid-50s, the first question from a client maybe, but what about the levels of energy? Well, okay, fair enough, but how much energy do you need? What about wisdom and knowledge of 30 years of navigating companies, navigating teams, maybe driving a different type of transformation? Uh, I think today we're making too much of an emphasis on the fact that transformation has to be technology. But in the past, we have other types of tra transformation in, in, the, in the business context that had nothing to do with technology. Companies evolve all the time, right? The question is, nowadays, they're being forced to do so because of technology. But I would agree with Lauren that, uh, that uh, the knowledge of technology is not a monopoly of the millennials. By, by, and, and Lauren is just at the top of the millennial, by the way. You're year one of millennial generation. <laughs> Quick plug, if you don't mind. We actually I'll have it, it. Sergio. I'll take it. <laughs> we actually have, is that a good thing? We actually have a, a program, by the way, leadership program based on immunity to change with Robert Keegan. So we do that with our clients as well. Well, th while, while I definitely agree and I definitely like that uh, Sergio and Lauren uh, really bluntly called out uh, Andreas's bias. Um, I think the all, also another question that is still in the, in the room, what can we do? So I think I would also like to share a bit more of a personal note now that we heard all the statistics and it's, it's brilliant what other organization, organizations have already achieved. So what I found, find truly valuable is just turning to someone who you trust, um, if you're really willing to, to change, to adapt to a new situation. And we've all faced those situations, either it's a career transition or it's a move to a new country. Um, so what do you do? Um, well, there's obviously friends and family who you can always talk to, but they know you, they love you, they don't always give you the answers that you can really that help you to proceed and to progress. So what I found really valuable, especially here in Singapore when I arrived was um, industry networks. So obviously uh, such as Swiss Cham, when I first arrived, that was really valuable. Um, others are the FinTech Association since I work in uh, the financial, financial services industry. So I find that very valuable to turn to people who have faced similar issues and they definitely share from their experience where I can definitely learn from different perspectives what has worked for them I can try and, and reflect whether this works for me as well and um, take it from there. Um, other more neutral um, uh, organizations that I've also really liked is um, the uh, Asia Institute for Mentoring. Um, again, I'm a big fan of mentoring and, and leadership coaching. So I'm definitely with this uh, 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 on this with uh, Sergio. I do believe that we can only become our best selves if we accept support from outside. And if we also acknowledge that we have flaws and it's perfectly fine, all of us have them. But I think in order to really progress and, and um, embrace transformation, may it be the digital one or really move on with, uh, with um, diversity, inclusion and equity, that's definitely something um, we cannot do alone. So I definitely would like to shout out to all those organizations that do a great job in helping us on personal level or company level. Sorry for... Uh... <laughs> No, no, I appreciate that. And, and, and I, I love it that we have very different viewpoints. I think we all knew the topic was too big to have the ultimate answer, but that's why I, I enjoy that we have different perspectives to, to tackle the, the, the topic, right? Thanks, thanks for sharing, uh, 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 Lisa. So um, maybe just, uh, we, we already have some questions from the audience and I wanna go over to that. Uh, because that's what it's all about. Uh, otherwise, it would be just a closed door conversation where people listen. We want to make sure that we address the questions um, that are there. So a reminder to all our guests and attendees, you can post your own questions, but you can actually also upvote them so that we have kind of a priority because traditionally we always run out of time to answer all of them. Um, just one last really quick one sentence answers from our, our panelists. Um, uh, if you had to decide the chicken and egg kind of equation, uh, is DX more likely to drive DNI? So digital transformation can drive um, diversity and inclusion, or is it the other way around? If you had to pick, 
What do you pick and why? Sergio. DX is going to drive D and I, but it should be the other way around. Lauren. My one sentence answer is my one word answer is agreed. Okay. Uh, Lisa. I also believe it's DX, um, yeah, enabling DNI um, for the reason that it's a common shared goal that um, yeah, companies can work towards without focusing on diversity and inclusion. It's something else that they can um, that they can look upon and uh, by that obviously include and and okay. enrich their culture. Can I Thank can you. I take can I take part of my sentence now? <laughs> <laughs> Your sentence joker. Who do you want to call? <laughs> No, the only thing that I was going to say is that the market is driving this. So the market has lost a ton of money, a ton, a ton of money. All of our clients have lost a ton of money. So they're looking at what is the best way to recruit? How do we, how do we gain some grounds? And so they're really digging in now into, okay, DX is one of them. How do we drive that? Diversity, inclusion, belonging, empowerment, people feeling like they want to work for our organisation and staying in our organisation. Uh, but I, I, I got to say that the external environment, I think, has driven DX, which is driven, which is driving DNI. Okay, cool. Um, now let's go to the questions from the audience, and the first one is from uh, Adam Juhas, I think that's how I pronounce it. Um, so he asks, "Crude gender quotas can hurt an organization. Uh, any quotas can hurt force." Uh, yeah. What's the alternative? How do we promote a corporate culture that leads to more, in this case, women in top tier positions organically or generally that fosters diversity, right? So it's gender or generally quotas to drive versus is there a better way? Or it's uh, sometimes it's the best first step. Who want to take a step at that? Maybe I'll take a quick one. Since yeah. That I do that day in and day out, right? Our philosophy is to um, ensure that, the, so we have a commitment towards diversity as a firm, and we work with top leadership teams and boards. Our commitment is also to make sure that this conversation is present with our clients, uh, every single one of our discussions. And most importantly, that while our commitment is to potentially on the search side of things to find the best candidates, the slate of candidates has to be as diverse as possible. By definition, so it starts from the begin from the moment that we start identifying potential new leaders for a company. Okay, um, and and I know there you know some countries put actually rules or or self commitments in place by the industry to have certain quota in boards by certain times. Uh, but but my point is always then does a quota lead to you just have to fill? Is it isn't it the opposite kind of you you achieve exactly the opposite? Somebody gets the seat just because of age, color, gender, whatever. And that's exactly what it wanted to fight in the beginning. Or uh, is it, could it be a step to get where you uh, actually- want until, to until it becomes more natural, the artificial approach may work, right? But it's not a permanent solution. Correct, okay. I agree. I agree. It's, as you said, Lars, it's the first step. And mm -hmm. it's the first step we've been taking for a long time. Um, and I think the thing that we need to change is the fact that we refer to things as crude quotas, which, which is true, which mm -hmm. is true but it is a necessary step in order to change the representation that we have at different levels. If you do it by choice, if you do it by discretion, you're not mm. going to force that in. And then a few years down the track, you will look at, oh, actually this, this has kind of worked. We need to do it from gender. We need to do it through sexual diversity. We need to do it through age. So it's, it's not just women quotas, but at the end of the day, businesses should take what they should get, what, what they can get because the data shows that it works. Okay, and um, one question that was asked earlier and Sergio directly jumped on that and I wanna, wanna uh, direct it at Lisa, it was about diversity. Uh, we, we already said it's way more than uh, gender. Uh, we touched on age, we touched on uh, sexual orientation. Um, is there something else? And, and you are kind of the representative of the young here. Sorry, I, I made you that, right? Um, uh, okay. Is it like, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that also from a perspective, we were hiring, somebody asked, Lars, what's your diversity policy? And I thought it was a discussion about LGBTQ+. I said, no, everybody in your company uh, studied this, but I'm an arts major. Do I actually fit in there, right? So, so what do you see, uh, and not just like, hey, being a representative of a generation, but what do you see are other criteria for diversity beyond just the 
easy black and white top of the pyramid ones. You just pointed it out. I was actually going to mention education. Um, so I myself, I studied literature and uh, linguistics. So definitely not what you would think of when uh, somebody works in the financial services sector. Um, so that's also something that I've seen across um, the different organizations that have had the pleasure to work with. And um, having worked in the startup ecosystem, that's definitely where you see a whole lot more diversity than in more traditional companies. Uh, I would like to point out, um, especially with startups, you obviously have a lower, um, a smaller pool to fish from, um, just because there's still a bigger run on to more corporate jobs these days. Um, so you definitely see um, a bigger diversity among, um, yeah, th there's design students, um, there's, um, but yeah, advisors in, in their 50s, um, there's the co-founders um, with a business degree as well as a technology degree in their 30s or 40s. So you have the full range of, of people and they make a brilliant team um, to drive digital transformation forward, either for their respective industry or in collaboration with companies. Um, so that's also something I would, yeah, I would like to point out. It doesn't have to be within a company on their own. It can also be you don't have to fight your own battles. You can look out, reach out for support, especially uh, larger corporations can also look into the startup world. What are the technologies and new business models um, that they could adopt and collaborate on? So again, this is also another dimension of diversity, I would say. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, that maybe the last question from the audience, because we also have to respect uh, that we normally try to uh, complete our webinars within an hour. Um, the question is, has the crisis really boosted diversity or rather tightened the old fashioned understanding of roles of genders? Think about home office and homeschooling in many countries, which put more pressure on women naturally. Lauren, you, you said you had your, your five year old in, in the corner. Um, so so uh, what, what's your take on, on this question? I think it's a very personal question and I think it's a personal question for everybody individually um, and so I, I don't want to create, I don't want to perpetrate or perpetuate I should say a stereotype. Hmm. Um, I mean I'm, I'm a working mom, I'm a partner, my partner is a partner um, so we're, we're very very busy and we make it work and I think as humans in relationships the time, I, I don't think the time has come but I think it, it's all about how you show up in a relationship. When things change, who jumps in, who taps out, how does that actually work? So I was on a diversity panel for Deloitte internally um, with some of our female partners. And, and I will share honestly um, that there were many who actually said, oh, I need to step back because my, my role is in the home. Uh, my role is in the home. And I said, I think that is also a traditional stereotype that if you choose, if that's what you like, then by all means, if that's your life, then high five to you completely. Um, but I don't think necessarily that it needs to reinforce stereotypes. I think, again, as Sergio said, don't waste an opportunity. Don't waste a crisis. How do you change how you show up at home? Because we're changing how we show up at work every day. Okay. Um, so um, let's, let's, let's wrap it up. Thank you very much. I think we could have just, we could discuss for two more hours and still we're just, we're just discover how much more we should discuss. But um, uh, Andreas, what are your takeaways so far uh, today? Um, and also having been in a leadership position running DX processes in a, in a more traditional company environment at some point. <laughs> so I, I think very interesting discussion. And, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, being aware of your own biases and your own you know, thinking uh, patterns, I think is very, very critical. And, you know, for, for me, it really comes down to, to personal uh, leadership and, and how you lead yourself. And that has to do a lot with how you understand yourself. So I think, you know, uh, that was the question to Lauren. Um, and, and, you know, by my own experience, that, that was a critical step also for me in my leadership journey. So um, I guess, uh, you know, Wrapping up what we have heard is we have a very different set of questions uh, that are very um, complex. And um, yeah, as you said, Lars, we could have continued for the next two hours. So uh, for me, it was, I, I learned a lot today. So I want to thank you, um, you know, the panelists for all their insight and the personal 
uh, story. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Andreas. And you know what I loved the most is like everybody pointed out that they disagree with Andreas. That, that, was, <laughs> <laughs> that was our rule coming in. That, that was, was the rule. rule. Exactly. <laughs> so so well, some of the sound bites that, that we that we that we heard today, right? So Lauren pointed out that diversity is about representation, inclusion, uh, and action, inclusion as an action, belonging as a feeling, and uh, well-being as, as the outcome. So I like that framework, and I, I think it puts things in context that you can't do one without the other. It's more a process than anything else. Um, uh, Sergio pointed out that DX has little to do with technology, but more about people. And we discovered that's also a kind of transformation on the pro on how we approach this kind of topic in general, right? Um, and then we had uh, Lisa saying that um, it's very important to, to don't just use yourself as the only perspective, but use industry network organizations that are valuable to share about their experiences that can bring a different perspective that can be a sounding board. Um, and that brings us to um, the sounding board and industry network like Swiss Gem uh, that kicked off this first uh, episode of the second season of DX Leaders. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, uh, Sergio. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and of course, uh, also our sponsor, Deloitte, um, and all the people behind the scenes that made today's event happen. Um, next episode, episode two of this season will be on the 27th of July. So in about a month's time, it's again a Tuesday, it's 5 p.m. And we're looking at effective leadership um, and how uh, health um, can be, uh, health technology uh, should be sustainable in the context of leadership. More about that in the, uh, in the final slides, otherwise, Thank you. Bye-bye and see you on the 27th of July. Thank Thanks you so much. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.